Hello fellow retro gamers. I enjoy putting together videos for YouTube and I grew up playing retro video games, so I thought I'd do my own review of Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest along with sharing some personal memories from the game. Castlevania 2 came out in Japan from, for their Famicom Nintendo system in 1987 and later here in the United States in 1988. It was cool because it had elements of a few different types of games rolled into one. We play through the game as Simon Belmont, bravest and boldest of the brave and bold gothic vampire hunters, respected by kings. You and he have earned their praises, not by crushing Viking invader invaders or Turkish hordes, but by stepping into the shadows of the Hell House of Castlevania in a duel to the death with the ruthless former ruler of Wallachia and Transylvania, the now vampiric once prince and now count Vlad Tepes Dracul. Dracula, I should say. Son of the dragon. It's been seven years since Simon's victorious battle with the brutal Impaler, but it proved increasingly painful as the wounds inflicted during the battle have been gnawing at his very soul. A beautiful maiden has appeared to Simon, warning him that he is now processed by Dracula's curse. She has instructed Simon to seek out and recover his five currently regenerated body parts and burn them at the ruins of Castlevania in order to seal away his curse and heal Simon's scars. With the most, as with most beautiful visions, the fair lady begins to fade. As Simon's face hardens with grim determination, she reaches out and touches it, saying, Fear not, brave Simon, for if you have faith and the courage to risk your life, you will find the strength to win again. Simon then turns and sets out back to Transylvania on business, to destroy forever the curse of the evil count, Dracula. It's a platforming game because you have to because you have Simon traveling across large and open areas of the Transylvanian countryside that include primeval forests with skeletal zombies of the damned and werewolves, bridges over dead rivers with fishmen lurking below the surface, graveyards with ravens, zombie hands reaching out from the soil, pirate skeletons, flying monkeys and mummies. Trips across water by shrouded ferrymen and five mansions filled with zombie hordes of skeletons, damned wraith knights, living gargoyles, Carmilla's not vampiros, large and floating vampiric head, and death himself, where the pieces of Dracula are guarded. Simon can be healed at churches by local priests and gather information and needed sub items from townsfolk and other shrouded characters who have dared to venture inside the mansions as well as outside in the cursed countryside. I'd like to now talk about the thoughts that occurred to me back then concerning the game along with la latter day reviewing of it by from other fellow retro gamers. Here goes. I watched a few of others reviewed videos including the comically slanted one of AVGN's James Rolfe and I agree that the design of the game doesn't lend itself to helping the player navigate it without a guide. I'm pretty sure Nintendo and Konami planned this for the sake of Nintendo Power sales. Back in those days, with no internet providing FAQ websites and YouTube visual walkthrough videos, we gladly forked over our allowances or mom and dad's hard-earned money to be shown the way through the 8-bit Transylvanian countryside. At best, the in-game villagers' statements and hidden books' clues offer little to no help in aiding us relieve Simon of his suffering by the curse, nor ours. My introduction to the game happened at my friend's house. He had an NES and got the game when it was first released. I think one of the reasons we didn't play through the game legitimately is that we were impatient kids, or at least I was, who didn't want to go through the grind of an RPG style game. Heck, at the time, I barely had patience to play Mario games. I would try just charging ahead and usually run into a Goomba or fall down a pit fairly quickly. I remember that our elementary media center had a copy of a third-party book, like those How to Win at Nintendo Games books, that had passwords for the game. We used one that granted the player all the whip upgrades, all the sub-weapons, and a, the full collection of Dracula's required body parts from the, game, from the game's get-go. We put in this code and we made our way straight to the Prince of Darkness. We defeated Old Fang Face and moved on to other games. A few years later, I got my own NES and a decent collection of games from my uncle. They included Castlevania 2, but I don't remember legitimately playing through it, and I think that NES and game collection ended up in one of my grandmother's yard sales. 
Later, I bought a refurbished NES at a retro game store in the middle 2000s when the retro game resurgence started. I wanted to play some of those old games again, so along with some others that I remembered, I picked up the entire Castlevania trilogy. Then, with the help of internet FAQ guides, I finally legitimately went through the entire game and defeated the Prince of Darkness again. But during my playthrough, I died many deaths and didn't know the, that heart farming could be done safely in the mansions without using up time, so I got the ending where Simon dies of his wounds and Transylvania is left waiting on a new hero to come along and free the land of Dracula's curse. Also through watching the AVGN videos concerning, concerning the game, during the game, I heard about the redacted version of the all, done by the Almighty Guru. I got a cartridge copy of it from Etsy and played through it. I'll be playing through yet another hacked version of it done by a talented programmer who goes by the name of Bisquit here soon. I agree with most of the player, players' opinions of these redactions and retranslations that the sped up and reworded dialogue and shortened day to night transitions are appreciated from both game hackers. Bisquit's version also includes an in-game map that was on the Japanese version, has an accessible list of the 13 clues collected for Dracula's Riddle, allows the player to retain the use of the previous whips for possible challenge replaythroughs, and even allows selecting the cross rosary, though I'm not sure why yet. I admit, though, that I still enjoy the highly cryptic to nonsensical wordings used by the original game creators and or translators, and I enjoy... And I enjoy looking back at the creative direction my young mind went with these quotes, even if they crippled my progress. Their construction at least serves the game's aesthetic, being that it's a game based on Dracula, both the real person, and his elevation to a mythical status as a vampire in Bram Stoker's 1897 novel. Having read the novel sometime between 4th and 5th grade, I was both fascinated and terrified by vampires after. I bought a crucifix at a local antique store and hung it on my wall to ward off any potential supernatural attacks while I slept. In my research, I came across some of the source materials Stoker used and felt there were some parallels in the wordings of them with the original game's dialogue. I'd like to take you through a few of them. As I do, please try to sense their mood-inducing vibe. If you've also read Bram Stoker's novel, that may help further your understanding of where I'm coming from. If you haven't read it, either get a copy or give it a listen via audiobook. Okay, let's begin. Quote 1 to restore your life, shout in front of the church. This one, though essentially unhelpful to the player, at least has a neat and old-time ring to it, and based on my research of Bram Stoker's Dracula novel, it comes across like something Stoker would have drawn from while reading Jane Emily Girard's book entitled The Land Beyond the Forest. That book lists many other superstitions that involve odd-looking practices. Before she wrote her book, she published an article called Transylvanian Superstitions that she that she later expanded on for the making of the book. This quote from Gerard's research sounds like it travels along the same vein of thought that the game creators went by. It goes, On New Year's Day, it is customary for the Romanian to interrogate his fate by placing a leaf of evergreen on a freshly swept and heated hearthstone. If the leaf takes a geratatory movement, he will be lucky, but if it shrivels up where it lies, then he may expect misfortune during the coming year. Another one is, to ensure the welfare of the cattle, it is advisable to place a gold or silver piece in the water trough, of which, out of which they drink for the first time on New Year's morning. This quote from this article also relates to the next game quote I want to look at. Next couple of quotes, actually. The dead river waits to be freed from the curse, and to replenish the earth, kneel by the lake with the blue, with the blue crystal. These book clue quotes definitely help maintain the mood of the game. They're also not completely unhelpful as Simon must locate a blue crystal and have it selected while kneeling at the Yuba River to reveal hidden platforms and stairs underneath. The water falls away, showing the replenished earth underneath it. 
but most of us probably still need Nintendo Power's guidance to know to select the right item and kneel at the river's bank. This procedure sounds like the aforema- sounds somewhat like the aforementioned rituals from Gerard's article. Quote number four, a rib can shield you from evil. Another one that sounds suave in my opinion. And this clue accomplishes the goal of being cryptic while still being helpful, somewhat. Though the game's instruction manual description of the rib might throw a, tim a timid and naive-minded person like my younger self off the trail. The manual statement saying the rib bone will make the ordinary hero feel like a spineless coward had me going a bit. Once I was shown that selecting the rib provisioned Simon with the shield to repel fireballs from gargoyles, dragon bones, Carmilla's mask, fishmen, flamethrowers, and two-headed creatures, I relaxed on the matter. Another personal throw-off from the manual was the heart's description. Watch out, the heart attacks. It made me wonder if selecting it would inflict damage or kill Simon. Quote 5, a flame flickers inside the ring of fire. On the surface, this one sounds awesome, right? But both this clue and another talking about a flame found above the sixth tree in the Dennis Woods do nothing towards helping the player locate the tossed flame subweapon. I remember trying to find a flame above a tree in the forest areas and never did. The flame's real location is a cave called Debye's Path. The player either has learned to make a point to throw holy water on every stone they saw or had the Nintendo Power point out the flame's location. I'll give you this silver knife to save your neck. This one was just witty on the game creator's part and fits the mood of the game nicely. Invest in an oak stake? This one is spoken by the shrouded figures in the mansions. A little more humor amid the horror. I also entertain the notion that these figures were Dracula himself doing what he could to ensure that Simon resurrected him, giving him another chance at undead life. I have gotten this I, I may have gotten this idea from reading Stoker's novel where the carriage driver who escorts Jonathan Harker to the castle is the count in disguise. Dracula's eyeball reflects the curse. Another very cryptic statement that most 10 and under kids probably barely had the patience to read, let alone comprehend. Again, the Nintendo Power was much more helpful in showing players what it meant. Another swab choice of words in my opinion though. Here's another doubler. The curse has killed the laurel tree and placed the laurels in a silk bag to bring them back to life. Definitely cryptic at best in making any sense to players, but again, I appreciate the mood of the wording here. And the famous quotes of, what a horrible night to have a curse and the morning sun has vanquished the horrible night sound great for the mood of the game, though the window that comes up and the time waiting in between between the dialogue may be too long for most players. And lastly, After Castlevania, I warn you not to return. This last statement I'll list is just ominous and therefore great for the mood of the game. As the player has aided Simon in nearly completing his quest, they can talk to this man in this town that is close to Castlevania or Dracula's castle. Again, I imagine this to be another disguised Dracula talking directly to Simon. Doesn't that thought enhance the fearfulness of this statement? I heard elsewhere that it is supposed to be just a random villager who must remember Simon from Castlevania 1. That may be correct, but it seems less entertaining to me. <clears throat> I prefer the idea of Dracula being aware of Simon's near completion of his goal and is throwing up a final threat to dissuade him from his mission. But Simon knows that this is do or die so he must proceed. This idea is also employed by the writers of the Worlds of Power book loosely based on the game. In this book, the protagonist, Tim, talks to a disguised Dracula in the form of a girl about Tim's age who tries to offer him chocolate, one of his vices. Simon, being Tim's travel partner, has warned him that they must not give in to any of the seven deadly sins, which include gluttony. Tim sees through Dracula's ruse, resists the disguised devil, returns to Simon, and they continue on their quest. By the way, I've recorded my own audiobook version of this story, and you can listen to it here on YouTube. I know the story is pretty corny, but if you want a kid-friendly avenue to share some of your video game nostalgia with your children, 
check out my link below to my playlist that has the entire book available for listening. I, ask, I act out all the characters in their unique voices and made sure to add images and music from the game. Please enjoy! Just last year, James Rolfe and his friend Matt Matei revisited Castlevania II yet again in one of their James and Mike episodes. Mike had never played through the entire game, saying he too preferred Castlevania I. As they made their way through it, James talked about the aforementioned Bisquit, who has very extensively examined Castlevania II. James shows the video viewer how Bisquit has listed his retranslation of the game on his website. He also has each player's statement and book clue listed as follows. In his finished translation of the game, the original Japanese kanji, the original release's poor but creative English translation, and his rewording of that. Like the Almighty Guru's redaction, Bisquit has made the villagers' statements and hidden book clues more useful to the player. Bisquit has also extensively looked into how the password system works on Castlevania II. I provided links to his website and YouTube channel if you want to learn something about how NES games were created. I hope you enjoyed my video. Please also check out my review of Bram Stoker's novel Dracula to learn more about its history and the literary devices he employed to make the novel a good scary story. I'm also working on reviews of other horror stories, both in cinema and literature, to show the elements authors and filmmakers use for making their stories scary, scary as well. A little postscript. I enjoyed playing through some recent fan tribute games for the Castlevania series this past fall. There are also many other fan-made ROM hacks out there to play from the other games in the trilogy. A few titles to look for are Chorus of Mysteries and the Holy Relics by Optimon, aka Chris Lincoln, and another one called Castlevania Blood Moon that Matt Matei covered in one of his videos. Those games revisit the gameplay style of Castlevania 1, but have a few elements of things from 2 and 3 as well. There is also a hack of Super Castlevania 4 entitled Super Castlevania 4 Other Castle by Hacker Red Guy. I also recently found the guy who is trying to build a hack of Castlevania Symphony of the Night, from scratch I think. He's given a Lucard new and amazing looking combo attacks and redesigned the bat and wolf sprites that he can turn into. So check those out and see what you can do to help to support those creators. I have links in the description box on where to find all of those as well. Thanks for watching.